Hello, it's my first Instagram live. Not sure if this is going through. Hopefully, this is connecting. If somebody could, oh, I get a wave, so that's great. All right, just gonna wait a minute here, or maybe sixty seconds for some other people to log in. All right, so first of all, it's great to be able to do an Instagram live. I've never done one of these before. Uh, I don't, I think I've clicked in a couple, one or two very short for um, Sean Baker. And I've got my blue uh, filtering glasses on here because I, I don't like to look at anything on a screen without some blue filtration. And uh, today's topic that we're going to, that I'm going to be presenting very quick is because I get so many questions on it and it's such an important strategy to optimize your health and it's going to be sprinting. So um, I'm excited to cover this topic. For those of you that have seen my sprinting vi uh, video, some of that will be covered, but I'm going to cover um, quite a bit of new material that's not in that. So hopefully make it uh, uh, really worthwhile. So first of all, a question I get a lot is um, from older people, my older followers, and just, you know, somebody will say, I'm in my 60s and 70s. I think I'm too old to sprint. The truth is you're not too old. You're never too old to sprint because sprinting is really a function of survival. It's been that way for 4 million years. So you got to be able to sprint fast to be able to save your life. That's the way it's been throughout humanity. Today, the absolute necessity to do that may not will be largely lost, but who knows? You may be somewhere, um, you know, where there's some craziness going on and you got to get away and your life is dependent upon it. So it's super important to be able to sprint um, in addition to the fact it's such an optimizing measure. So for those of you who are old, uh, older, I should say, um, it's never too old. You just got to start a little bit slower and work your way up to it. So the key to starting if you're a little bit older is to make sure you don't accelerate too fast. So basically you take your time to accelerate to max effort. So that might take you 20 seconds, 30 seconds, but your investment is really doesn't begin in this strategy, uh, sprinting, until you've reached that maximum effort. So take your time, slowly accelerating. You don't have to be in some kind of crouch position and blast off the line. I don't recommend you do that. If you're younger and healthier and you're custom sprinting, then you can work on it. But the real value is not in accelerating. The real value is in sustained maximum effort. Okay, so that's, I want you to get there very slowly and work up to it. And uh, as far as warming up, I get a lot of questions about warming up. Um, you can do a little bit of a jog if you want for 30, you know, uh, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a minute or two, uh, if you like. Um, I don't think that's, um, you know, a bad idea. Uh, but I want to take this moment to, to point out something with regard to warming up. The only reason we have to warm up, we're the only species in the world that we have to warm up is because we are so chronically diseased. So I want you to appreciate that every other animal in the wild can accelerate off the line in a, in a nanosecond. Second. And they have to be able to do that because their, their survival depends upon it. And so the fact that we have to warm up should really alarm everybody and more importantly, motivate you to get healthy. Because what you wanna be able to do is be that 60, 70 year old that can accelerate off uh, a dime in a nanosecond because you're that healthy, you have that little chronic disease. So yeah, um, the biggest thing is diet. You gotta, you gotta optimize your health, get rid of your visceral fat. I say it over and over again, that's gonna put you in a better state to be able to, to sprint and to, uh, to be able to leverage this optimizing measure. So a little warm up and then some stretching. Now, a real key um, thing to, to stretch, and I'm just gonna show it to you, and I gotta lower this you know, so, you, so you'll be able to see this. And I'm just gonna do this uh, um, in this manner down here. Uh, this is a, a squatting position, okay? So I like to do this before I start my sprint, okay? 
So it's called squatting. I have a pretty good video on this on my YouTube channel, um, but check out my knees, check out the angulation of my hips and look at my feet. They're flat on the ground. Okay, so that's, I'll turn this down here just so the, the script doesn't, but you gotta get your, 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 heel, your feet flat on the ground. Okay, so squatting, this is all I do <laughs> uh, to get ready for a, for a sprint. I go in this manner and I hold it for about a minute you know, 60 seconds or so, and then I'm ready to do my max effort sprint. Now, you may not be there. You may have to stretch and do a little short jog, but at a bare minimum, I think everybody should get into a position where they can squat and learn how to do that. So check out my YouTube video uh, on squatting. Now, another question I get is, what about if I have bad knees, okay? I can't, you know, I had to give up... Um, um, I had to give up my, uh, my, my running because I have bad knees. So the truth is, with sprinting, you're going to sprint only seconds. So you can get back into running. It's the distance running, in my opinion, and more precisely, the generated reactive oxygen species for that durational exercise that harms your joints and caused that problem, degenerative joint disease in your knees, and prevented you... Um, and it's preventing you from to, to continue to run. So sprinting is just for seconds. So you'll be able to introduce. My clients I work with tell me the same thing, particularly older clients. I've got bad knees. I can't sprint. I have never encountered one single person that wasn't able, able to overcome their bad knees and adopt a practice of sprinting eventually. It's just going to take you longer. So a couple tips. You have bad knees. You should sprint on grass, kind of a softer surface or sand, because that will help absorb some of the, the uh, uh, demands and pressures and the forces of uh, uh, sprinting. And you're gonna sprint for shorter distances and maybe a little bit less frequent. So get in the, get in the habit of running on some softer surfaces. And uh, with regard to you know, surfaces in general, it's best to run on a level surface. Key to survival and optimization is being always healthy and avoiding injuries, okay? So um, I recommend to my clients that are older, uh, as far as surface, if they run, or it's a little bit, the biomechanics of sprinting are easier if you sprint up a hill, okay? So going, sprinting up a hill means that the sophistication, the complexity is easier because you're not going as fast, those movements. So sprinting up the hill is oftentimes easier. It may, in terms of difficulty, in terms of strength required, it may be a little more challenging, but the biomechanics are easier to sprint up a hill. So what does that mean? Sprinting down a hill is far more complex and more likely to cause an injury. Do not sprint down a hill. Even if you're young, your, your risk for an injury is a lot more complex. The other take home point on injury avoidance is never sprint up stairs. They're unnatural. Think about it. Four million years, we never had stairs. They're an unnatural surface. You are at risk of catching a toe on that lip and at maximum speed, just causing untold damage to that beautiful joint in your knee. It's not worth it. You can optimize yourself by sprinting up a hill, okay? So avoid the stairs. Use a natural surface, level ground. Another thing as far as grass goes, be careful if you use a five-finger vibra. Okay, see these toes? We're gonna to get into some footwear. Do not wear these, sprint in grass. This is an unnatural. I had a terrible meniscal injury when this got caught in the, un, uh, this unnatural appendages, got caught in the thick grass that was running and stopped me dead in full sprint and I had a terrible meniscal injury. So I prefer to run in open toe, you know, open uh, open toe box shoes without those um, five finger appendages, five finger um, five finger vibrance. I'd love the shoe otherwise, and it's a minimalist shoe. But you don't you don't want to be springing on grass with those five finger shoes. So that that's important. Um, now, what one other kind of footwear that I do wear that I like a lot are moccasins. Okay. So I get these things, Minnesota moccasins off Amazon. Um, they're about 55 bucks. Again, you never have to worry about me having any kind of financial kickback. When I recommend something, it's because I like it 
and I get no money from it. God bless the people if they're getting a kickback. But when I tell you something, it's because I like it and not because I'm getting some money, okay? So these moccasins uh, typically come with uh, an insert in them, okay? Some kind of a, a sole thing that's glued in. I rip them out. I pull them out because four million years, we just ran on single layered uh, skin. And so um, these, these feel so much better than shoes to walk around in and to sprint in. I'm, you know, in the winter time, I live in Minnesota, 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 uh, Minnesota, and I sprint in a gym that has a track in it. And people see me sprinting in the moccasins and that's cool. You know, that's what I wear. They're, they're a lot more comfortable um, than footwear. And this has plastic, so it makes noise. These things are silent, basically, when I'm running on the track. So these are really cool to, uh, to sprint in. I get about a size and a half smaller, though, than what I typically wear. I get them wet, and they're, they're really tight on my feet. I put, put my feet in, I mold them, and then I let them dry uh, to that, and they just fit like a glove on my feet at that point. So that's a little learning lesson. But yeah, Native Americans wore these. People all over uh, the world wore single layer uh, moccasins for four million years. No cushion, no insert. So if you don't want to get moccasins and you want to get um, traditional footwear, the kind of footwear I recommend is minimalist shoes, okay? Do not get shoes with big flared heels, you know, those big, you know, flared things to prevent supination and, and pronation. You want that to happen. You want to be able to make those adjustments. You don't want to stay flat footed in that. You want to be able to make those micro adjustments. When you're at maximum speed, you're going to have to do that, maintain your balance. So no flared wedge heels, no support. So when I get those, when I get these shoes, I take them and I pull those inserts at them, okay? I make them as natural and thin as possible, okay? Now these are called minimalist shoes, okay? So um, minimalist shoes or minimum footwear um, is, is a kind of terminology you wanna look for uh, to, uh, to use those kind of shoes if you're gonna get those, those kind and uh, uh, it's helpful. Now, a little tip. When you're wearing these, these shoes, cause I, I talk about patients who come to my office and, uh, I remember when being with a patient, I took my shoes off to show them, you know, my feet and, and, and different things, filled the whole room with this bad smell. So about uh, probably eight years ago, I figured out that bad smell was from bacteria. So what do I do in my shoes? I get some Bragg's apple cider vinegar, okay? This has living microbes in it, good bacteria. And I pour, I pour this Bragg's in my shoes and then I swish it around, okay? So those living microbes are in there. No more foot odor. Now I can confidently take my shoes off barefooted in front of patients and clients and no bad smell. So remember that trick, apple cider vinegar, Bragg's. And when you buy this, buy it because it's got living microbes and it brews in the dark. Buy it in the back of the shelf. Do not buy it up front because these living microbes get killed by light. So, you know, get the one reaching the back and the far back of the shelf where it's dark because it will have higher content of living microbes and put it in there. And uh, I put it in my shoes. Uh, I put, put, put that in my shoes at least once a week and I put it on my feet. Now, before I put the apple cider vinegar, I put just coconut oil on my feet, okay? Coconut oil, organic, cold press, unrefined. This is Costco. Um, I'm putting it on my feet, so it's, it's, it's a good buy. It's, it's a really good place to get coconut oil. And I rub it all over my feet. It's antimicrobial. And then after I get that coconut oil on my feet, I put the apple cider vinegar in, mix it in my feet. Uh, with regard to being immediately exploded off the line, there's a principle called selection pressure, okay? That was the force of nature that motivated us as human beings to be as healthy as possible so we could live longer and live better. So selection pressure, you know, it's that force, that influence on us on a daily basis where we would just choose the best food. We'd hunt the best organisms, best specimen in a, in a, in a, uh, a herd of animals, not the easiest. Every other species in the world hunts the easiest. No, we hunted the very best because it's higher nutritional value and higher fur, higher skin value in the microbes. So it's really key, uh, you know, this force of selection pressure to choose 
choose the best. So I'll be doing future Instagrams and future videos on the microbiome. Stay tuned about microbes. It's really, really important. Now, as far as sprinting goes, uh, one thing I do um, is I often sprint against my kids, okay? I run, I get in races with my kids. I run and, and race with other people uh, in the army and the military with me, uh, people who I work with. You want to be, you want to compete, okay? So that competition will drive you to perform better. So uh, if you don't have anybody to run with, run by yourself and videotape yourself, okay? Analyze that video. I'm so glad I started videotaping myself about six years ago. So I posted a couple videos of myself uh, on my last post in IG. Hopefully you guys saw it. I sucked 2016. Well, I started sprinting 2010. Just imagine how bad I was in 2010, right? The very first time I started, I did a 360 and looked around in my yard to make sure none of my neighbors were watching me. I was that bad, I thought I was gonna fall over. So no matter how old you are and how bad you are, start slow, don't, don't worry about you know, how you're gonna look. It's, it's how you wanna optimize yourself. So get started slow and slowly accelerate and, uh, and videotape yourself at the beginning because you're gonna be so encouraged. You're gonna get so much better over a period of time. And if you analyze yourself, videotape yourself, you're going to see what you got to do to work on. So that's, that's a really key thing. Now, the best time for me to sprint is I like to sprint in a fasted state, okay, when I haven't eaten anything, when I'm, especially at the end of a fast. That's a great time when you're really, you know, a lot more challenged, a lot more ketogenic. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I fast 72 uh, to 96 hours straight, sometimes 60 hours, I mean, uh, five times seven, what, 24, 120 hours. So a long, long fast. And that's when I like to do my toughest workout. So um, sprint in a fastest state if you can, but we would also have sprinted when we had food in our stomachs. So sometimes you have to, you have to uh, sprint uh, after you've eaten, get away from an animal or, you know, something going on. So uh, the key to this is mixing it up. Okay, so sometimes sprint in a fasted state, sometimes sprint occasionally when you've eaten. But when you've eaten, all your food um, is in your, your gut and your blood goes there. So, you know, it's through gastric steel. You don't have as much blood to go to your muscles to help you sprint and also help you recover. So after you sprinted, you're recovering and those muscles need that recovery. And if you got divided missions, you know, food and recovery, that's not a great thing. Uh, you do a few times, but generally uh, sprint on a fastest state. Now, numbers, not a big number guy, okay? Nature favors variety. How far should you sprint? I kind of like, if you want a number, kind of like about 100 meters. That's the point where you've expended your glycogen and then you're switching over to anaerobic metabolism. So I like to sprint for at least 100 meters maybe a little bit longer than that, but my sweet spot is basically about 100 meters. Why? That's what nature puts you in. That seems to be what na we're bred to do, about 100 meters, okay? And uh, so you got this biological system built in that says about 100 meters. Now you can do longer than that, but you're gonna be training to that and your ability to do shorter won't be as good. So you're, it's basically, you get away from the threat, you catch whatever it is you gotta do if you're hunting, um, intervene quickly in those first 100 meters. So that's my sweet spot. And then as far as numbers go, you know, you might just do one sprint, get started. Um, and then if you're able to do a little bit more, um, you can do two or three sprints as far as resting in between. Uh, sometimes I don't rest. Sometimes I do rest. Kind of like my ideal, what I like to do though is hmm, maybe about 100 meters uh, wait, you know, like wait a couple minutes and recover so I can do max effort again to, in two to three minutes. And I, I break it up, you know, about th three to four minutes, mix it up. And some days I'll break up and I'll do a sprint uh, every, um, every hour, you know, mix it up that way. Nature likes variety. Sometimes I'll do 10 sprints back to back, very little rest in between. Other times I'm resting a lot. So don't get hung up on numbers and how long and how many sets. Mix it up. Nature likes variety, okay? Nature does not like your schedule in the circuit, in the gym, 90 minutes every day. Nope, 
nature likes to mix it up. Sometimes it's five minutes, sometimes it's a half hour, sometimes, you know, longer. But mix it up, get that variety because that's what nature introduces. And now let me tell you about another adjunct, okay? BFRs, blood flow restriction bands, BFRs, okay? This is what they look like, blood flow restriction bands. You can get them off Amazon. They're cheap now. Why? Because they're elastic. So what, and they are literally elastic, but they're an elastic good. What that means, they're not essential. So right now, the essential goods, gas, food, electricity, all that is going up because we need that. Things like this, gym equipment, cheap now. There's a surplus of it, so it's time to get BFR bands. You can get them really cheap off Amazon. So get blood flow restriction bands, and um, they've been around for almost 40 years. I'm just going to come out and say they're safe. You can use these things. we got lots of technology, uh, lots of experience, lots of studies saying they're advantageous. We are now using them in the military in special operations. Why? Build muscle make you stronger, make you faster, shorter period of time, better results. One study, NCAA Division I sprinters, took two groups of those sprinters. One group wore BFR bands, the other group didn't. Did the exact same workouts for six weeks. MRIs in the beginning, MRIs in the end. The ones that wore these things had more muscle and were faster, increased their, their, their running speeds significantly more than the people who did not use these things. So I recommend them. Now, where do you do them? You put them between your, your deltoids and your biceps, okay? Put them right there. You can still see a little bit line because I was out doing some pull-ups right before this. That's why I was a little windy when I got on this thing. But uh, yeah, so right between your, 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 your deltoids and your biceps, you put these on and just you know, tighten them up gradually. If, if your, your arms are tingling, you got them on too tight, too much blood flow. Um, but you want to get that. And then as far as your legs go, um, I'm just going to show you my, you want to put them up high in your legs. And I like to wear compression shorts, okay? When I put these things on, I like to put, have compression shorts over them because when you put the big bands on, um, they, they're, they, they can be tied on your skin and it can, they can sometimes irritate it. So I like those compression shorts. Guys, do not wear compression shorts otherwise. I just put them on when I do my sprinting, but you want cotton, 100% cotton boxers. You want your, 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 your gonads, your testicles hanging out, not tight up in compression shorts. So you get that maximum coolness and maximum freedom so you can produce as much testosterone as you possibly can. You need every single nanogram of testosterone you can get, particularly when you get to my age, okay? So that's super important. Um, and in the Army, uh, we go commando, okay? Nothing. <laughs> so, but when you're out sprinting, you probably need something or you could get in trouble with your neighbors. So just saying, compression shorts for a short period of time, uh, beneficial. All right. Um, one key feature of sprinting, all right? One thing I want you to do is get short of breath, okay? When you get short of breath, it's really important that you move your diaphragm, okay? I'm going to have to take my shirt off because I want to be able to show you this, okay? I don't like to do this otherwise, but you got to get this, okay? Understand what you got to do. So when you are breathing, you're going to have to have maximum excursion of your diaphragm, okay? Do you see my intercostals here? You got to expand those intercostals. You got to move that diaphragm maximally. Okay, there's a respiratory movement, a respiratory valve we call vital capacity. Maximum amount of air you can breathe in, combined with the maximum amount of air you can breathe out. Okay, nothing gets you more short of breath, and engages your diaphragm and your intercostals to be more short of breath and get that vital capacity up better than sprinting, okay? So when you get sprinting, you wanna develop that kind of state where you have maximum vital capacity. So you're really sucking in that air to do that, okay? So, and then after you get accomplished, I like to do sprinting with my mouth closed. Sometimes I like to sprint with my mouth open. But one thing I like to do is recover by breathing in and out of my nose once I've recovered a little bit, 
um, breathing in my nose because it produces more nitric oxide. It's very interesting. It gets you recovered a lot faster than nitric oxide. So it's, it's really key. Now, uh, last point I want to be able to make is, um, is on MRIs, okay? So I've, I've shown this before, but anybody tuning in has never seen this, okay? This is how much visceral fat was present in this guy in two months just from adding sprinting and he got rid of all his visceral fat, didn't do anything different other than sprinting. So it's a super optimal change. You're never gonna see this appreciably on a DEXA scan or a bioimpedance scan. You know, it's just a lot more meaningful to see that. Not only did he get rid of that visceral fat, but the dude got jacked. He literally was jacked before the, the MRI tech said he, before he did the scan, he's like, this guy's jacked. You know, you just, you just get amazing muscles when you start sprinting. It's, it's fantastic. And so you build muscle, got a six pack. And why is that? Because it produces this glorious molecule called a myokine. I can put my shirt back on. So myokines are these molecules that get released when you do high, you know, maximum intensity exercise, I almost slipped up in my, my own rule. When, when I describe sprinting, it's not high intensity. That, that's less than maximum intensity. It's maximum intensity. Maximum effort is the key defining feature to sprinting. Running as fast as you possibly can. And when you do that, you produce more myokines, which are messaging molecules, chiefly produced in your big muscles of your lower extremities and in your glutes that send messages throughout the rest of your body like build muscle, okay? So when you sprint, you build your arms. You know, if you go on my Instagram and you, you take a look at, at Matadi, M-A-T-A-D-I, Matadi has got great muscles and he's just a sprinter. Now the dude is lifting weights, but before he had this, I just didn't believe him. He had amazing muscle without lifting weights or exercising. All he, all he did was sprinting. So if you want to build muscle, burn fat, you you'll leverage myokines to do that. The other interesting molecule is LACFI. It's a brand new molecule where you, in the journal, uh, journal Nature, which is one of my favorites, it's a great journal. Um, they measured the highest quantity of molecule produced in maximum intensity exercise was LACFI. It's a hybrid molecule between lactate and phenylalanine. That's a hard one to say, phenylalanine. But so it's LACFI, L-A-C-P-H-E. Now, they looked at different forms of exercise. Um, the lowest to produce in lac distance running. You already know, if you follow me, I'm not a fan of distance runners. Just look at those people, those poor people out jogging. This is how they look on the street. <sighs> Does that look enticing, inviting? No. Look at a sprinter. Game face on, man. That makes you want to do it because it's biologically appealing. It's such a great exercise. Short distance, crush it and you, you, you benefit from. So lowest lack fee, distance running. Now, the second highest to produce was weightlifting, resistance training. That's a great one. I lift weights, I get my clients to lift weights, it's wonderful. But better than even weightlifting, resistance training is sprinting. So researchers in the know who are following the latest cutting edge and are tracking lack fee, that you want, you get it from sprinting. And by the way, they looked at everything that's produced. They didn't look at certain targets. They just looked at all these molecules that came out when you did sprinting. And the one in the produced the most, the highest quantity, lac fee. So you want to get this lac fee. It's an optimizing measure. So it's, it's a really good thing. All right. Well, that's, I think those are all the points um, that I want to be able to make. Um, and so we'll handle some questions that, that uh, my faithful assistant wrote down to capture us. So, um, uh, what if lack of dis dislocation? All right, so somebody had a question about dislorification. 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 I'm not sure what dislorification is. I, I'm guessing that that person is talking about dislocation. So, if you have joint laxity, you do not want to be doing sprinting if you have a lax joint. So, work with a good physical therapist. Get stability of that knee. Do not try to do anything that's going to set you up for an injury. So dislocation, make sure you get cleared by an orthopedic surgeon. You want a good orthopedic surgeon? Um, go on Twitter, um, Morea Ortho, M-O-R-E-Y-R-A, Morea, M-O-R-E-Y-R-A, Morea Ortho. Um, check him out, Dr. Carlos Morea, orthopedic surgeon. 
What's he do? He sits his clients down, talks about diet and lifestyle. Before surgery, he will not cut on anybody without addressing lifestyle first. He's the only orthopedic surgeon that I know that does that. So big shout out to that guy. He is awesome. I happen to know from medical school, he's one of the finest human beings I know. So if you got, you got issues with dislocation, you're going to want to get to a good ortho. Um, how many... Uh, uh, max, effort sprints. max effort sprints. Okay, so we talked about that. Mix it up. You may only do one. You might. I've done as many as thirty. So mix it up, spread it out. Just get variety. Again, that, that's a thing. Um, hormonal benefits of sprinting uh, and stress. Okay, so great questions. Hormonal benefits. So testosterone gets released. Uh, testosterone, human growth hormone gets released in the other molecules, myokines and lactate that I talked about. So it's going to optimize your capacity for um, hormonal biosynthesis. So really key beneficial thing to do. And a really key benefit for stress mitigation is when you engage in sprinting or really anything maximum intensely, you, you can do this from, from climbing a rope, push-ups, um, you know, hand, handstands. Just some maximum intensity effort for a short period of time, it reduces your cortisol load. So here's the point. A little antelope walking around on the ground, uh, it's a little head down, chewing on grass, and there's tigers and lions milling around. That thing, that poor antelope has got tons of cortisol being produced. It's all stressed out with all these lions and tigers. Now, those lion, a lion or a tiger attacks, chases that little antelope, um, assuming the antelope gets away, that antelope just reduce its cortisol load from the sprinting, okay? So the maximum intensity exercise, the event of sprinting, just reduce the cortisol. So what's the take-home point? If you are stressed out, you got bad emails, you got tough telecons, you got uh, tough, difficult telephone uh, conversations or projects you're working on, and those are lions and tigers around you, uh, you need to sprint. You need to get out and sprint. You need some push-ups. If it's raining, you can't get your butt outside to, to sprint or whatever. you got to do some push-ups and pull-ups. But that's what you want to do, be able to, to do that. Um, uh, okay, so somebody had a question about how often do you uh, do, you do uh, vinegar. I, d I do vinegar. I try to do vinegar every day on my feet, okay? I just have a little bit of a ritual. I put that, that coconut oil on my feet and I rub in a little bit of vinegar. It doesn't take much, like seriously, like a half teaspoon of vinegar on your feet. I put it in there. As far as my, my footwear goes, that is almost a tablespoon in my shoe and I shake it up at least once a week. So that's that's how often I do that. Um, other questions? Um, um, uh, how many sections work out? Uh, sprinting? Strength, strengthen your feet and improve your, your gait. Okay, so how does sprinting affect your your feet and gait? So yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, let me just I'll show you my feet. You know, I'm I'm usually I'm gonna turn my uh, hopefully this this turns my camera on. But like most older guys in their fifties and sixties and seventies start having, um, I have pretty youthful my musculature my subcutaneous uh, tissues are full. Holes are optimized when you when you sprint and create healthy feet. And those those healthy feet are super awesome for, for also walking, uh, climbing trees, climbing rocks, whatever I got to do in my life uh, to stay healthy. So uh, you want to be able to uh, have healthy feet. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Um, anybody else has? Um, I, I I think I've covered most of the questions. I apologize. If I missed, uh, we missed some of your questions, but uh, want to try to, you know, not, not belabor these things, try to keep it as efficient as possible. Um, I will encourage you, if you uh, have any other additional questions, try to message me. Um, I'm, I get a lot of messages, but if you just put in Instagram live question, I'll try to give you um uh, some, you know, I'll, I'll try to answer your questions. I get a lot. Of, I got great followers. I think I get the greatest followers uh, on on Instagram and Twitter. So uh, and social media and YouTube. So uh, somebody had a question about toy, toe spacers. I'm not a big fan of toe spacers. Um, I tried them out for a while. What What's helped my feet the most is sprinting and walking and standing. So that's really key. Um, let's see if there's any other questions there. Um, 
so yeah, if you got arthritis on on your feet again, reduce. Get rid of your visceral fat. Get rid of you know you got a gasoline fire there going inside your abdomen, releasing all these cytokines, contributing. You can sprint, but it's just pumping out more cytokines, more inflammation causing arthritis. So. I recommend that you eliminate your visceral fat, get an MRI scan, pay out of pocket, $500, get your doctor to write an order. Uh, if you're paying out of pocket and you know, go through insurance, he or she should not have any, any complaints about doing that. Uh, here's another question. Interesting, sprinting barefoot on grass, do you think uh, is better? Yeah, man, I love sprinting uh, barefoot. Problem is risk benefit analysis. Are you going to step on a piece of glass, piece of metal? Because in the old days, we didn't have to worry about those kind of things. Today, we got to worry about it. So if you're in a pristine area, like one area, I like to sprint uh, with my kids. Uh, my sons, who are really into sprinting, is um, where I recorded my video is on a, on a lacrosse field where they have uh, AstroTurf. Because that's pretty clean. There's no glass and stuff uh, in that. So I like, to, I like to sprint on that. And, of course, I like to sprint on the beach that's a that's a great fa a great place to to spread all right well hopefully <clears throat> um this was worthwhile to you i'll just take the opportunity as i'm close to thank you guys for following me um on instagram uh promote my be an ambassador so i, I do this because of the gift that health has been I literally feel like I got 30 years of quality life added to me at the age of 59. So I, I walk around feeling like I'm 20. So really, really value that. I really, really value what I got and I'm trying to give it away to everybody. So um, share that with other people. It will encourage me that this is worthwhile to do. I'm trying to solve the biggest problem in our country and for humanity, which is chronic disease. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to share my content and uh, encouraging messages um, that, that you guys share back and questions. And that's it for now. And I'll see you on a future Instagram Live. Dr. Shawnette.